everyone. Welcome to lecture 11. So it has been, I think, um, 10 days, 11 days since our last lecture before midterm. So long time no see. I think we need to spend some time today to recap the trails that probably a lot of us have forgot. But before we begin, we're gonna go for a quiz again. So quiz 11, I'll actually upload, open the poll. Just one second. Let me double check just one second. Okay, so let's begin. Quiz 11.
All right. So I'll leave the quiz open and let's proceed with the recap. But before that, I have a few announcements. So assignment two is due this Wednesday. So please make sure to submit it. Of course, you will have the um, no penalty late days. You have up to seven days for all the assignments. So of course, um, try to be strategic which assignment you use the, the late days. And assignment three will be up next Wednesday, but there's a good news, which is that the um, assignment three and four will be relatively short. So hopefully you won't put as much time as you put in assignment one and two. And please make sure to come to the class next Wednesday because it will be the first discussion session and you will be, your, uh, all of you will be divided into four groups. Each group will have about 10 people and TA will be leading each group and we will have a discussion on the, the papers that we have discussed or at least the, or on the reading, reading list on the schedule. So the point is that I'll give you out instructions soon, but the point is that uh, you should be there to get your 5% participation score. And please let the TA know, let uh, Myung know, the head TA, if you cannot participate, we'll see what we can do about it. Okay, so let's begin with lecture 10 recap. So we ended, we started last, last lecture with um, some of um, I would say characteristics of uh, encoder decoder, which is different from either text classification or token classification. One of them was actually about during decoding how we train the decoder. And although we'll not be going into details today, especially um, during the recap, we'll co come back to this. In fact, um, after transformer and language model, which will be on Monday. But the point is that, the point was that because you have to decode one word by one word during training, it is possible that your previous output is wrong. And then during training, it is, not, it is not clear whether you want to still make your model trained on predicting the next word, even if the previous word was wrong. And if you do that, that's called teacher forcing, basically, whether your previous output was wrong or not, you still fit in the correct output of the previous time step to the current time step, and then try to predict the, the ground truth. Whereas you can also try to feed previous, which is in this case, if the, the previous output, previous token output was wrong, then still it gets propagated to the, the current time steps input. So there are pros and cons. Teacher forcing is good because even if you got it wrong in the previous time step, you, you fix it right away. But then feed previous can be also good because it's actually resembling the actual inference input distribution better than the teacher forcing. Although we can safely say that teacher forcing works usually better. And we're gonna come back to that when we are actually covering the decoding strategies. <clears throat> and the main topic of the last lecture was actually about the bottleneck problem. So in fact, this was not covered in lecture 10 was in the lecture nine, which was about the, how the encoder decoder worked in the early stage, in the early years, where, um, well, I mean, when it was actually first proposed that you basically have the input here. And then you use the output of the last time step. And this, we're assuming that this, Vector C contains the entire meaning 
of the input sentence. And we only use this for decoding the output. And the, the grand premise here is that then your vector C has to contain very well the entire meaning of the input sentence. And I wanted to actually point out, um, I hope you remember that, is it feasible information theoretically to contain the uh, entire sentence's meaning? And I said, yes, it's, it's actually not too difficult because suppose you have a vocab size of uh, say, um, 100,000, and then each word, let's say your vocab size is, let's discuss this again. So let's suppose that your vocab size is um, 100,000, which is quite typical, especially in the, um, the subword BP kind of um, tokenization. Usually we actually use something like 30K. This was the case for BERT. But let's say it's 100K. Then what is 100K? It's actually 100 times 1,000. And we know that 1,000 is about, um, in fact, let's be more specific. Um, 1,000 is smaller than 2 to the power of 10. 100 is smaller than 2 to the power of um, 7, right? Am I right? Yeah, because two to the power of seven is 126. So um, actually I'll just write it here. So two to the power of seven is 120, 128, I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah. Um, and two to the power of 10 is um, 1024, right? So we know that then this is basically smaller than two to the power of um, 17. which means each word information theoretically can be contained in a 7 bit 17 bit vector i mean 17 bit um, i would say not vector but um, well it can be represented with 17 bit so 17 bit is what well that's like fairly larger than the four bytes because one byte is equal to eight bits. So if 17 bits, it's like about two bytes. We can say two bytes or three bytes, right? And then let's say the input sentence length is something like 32, which is reasonable for most sentences. Then what we're saying is then 32 words, times 17 bits per word times one byte per a bit. So what is the size of the input? Well, then you basically 32 divided by eight is four and four times 17 is um, 68, right? So this is 68 bytes. So you can contain the most sentences into 68 bytes information theoretically. And what is the size of a typical vector C? Let's say its dimension is 256. Well then 256, 256 um, of a, dimensions times, let's say we use half precision float, then it will be 16 bits per dim. And we have to also multiply, of course, one byte per a bit. Then um, how large is that? Well, eight gets canceled by 16 bits, so it's two. So, and then two times 256 is 512, bytes. So you see 512 bytes is definitely larger than 68 bytes. So 
I wanted to highlight this because pe when people say that you cannot cram the meaning of a whole sentence into a single vector, well, number one, I'm not sure that will be true for the, um, I mean, I'm not sure that's a true statement. Although I agree that it's usually the case for most models. And number two is that uh, what people usually mean is that, well, it's really hard to, because um, these vectors are, they are actually real numbers, right? And then you cannot really contain a lot of meanings into one real number, even if the one real number is like something like 16 bit, two bytes, but then it's really hard to contain um, a lot of meaning into these numbers. So the anyways, the it is still true that whenever we try to summarize or compress the meaning of a sentence into one vector, it's very difficult to actually make that um, happen with, uh, for instance, like 256 dimensions. So it's called bottleneck problem because you're basically your input and output, when you're trying to map the input to the output, you are bottlenecked by this vector or the uh, size of this vector. So that led us to, well, um, the idea that can we actually directly access the source sentence instead of trying to summarize this into one vector? And that was the motivation for the attention. So what was the attention mechanism? Well, so let's go back to this encoder decoder, original encoder decoder. We try to summarize X into C and then C gets used in every decoding time step. But then this C is just a fixed, it's just a static summarization of the input. And the attention, what it tries to do is that it's kind of trying to dynamically summarize the input as you decode each output in the output space. So you can think of it as a dynamic summarization or another way to look at it is actually you're directly accessing a few relevant tokens because if you're summarizing dynamically then probably you only want to look at a few words on the input side, right? And that's why they're basically the same thing. And you can also think of this as a memory access. If you think of the input vectors as the memory, then you basically choose which vector to retrieve. But the canonical memory access is non-differentiable. So you have to use the softmax to approximate the attention mechanism for differentiability. And how we do that? Well, so now we want to define the C C is still, we are using the C as the uh, summarization of the input, but then we had just one C before because, well, in the encoder decoder without attention, you only have one C, but here we have a C for every time step. So that's why we have CI. And CI is equal to the sub summation of alpha IJ times HJ, here the alpha IJ is the atten attention weights and H is the vectors or the output of the encoder side. So what does that mean? Well, let's say that um, suppose alpha IJ is um, one for J equal to two and zero for J not equal to two. And what does that mean? Well, that means then you, you will be only getting the H of two because it will be zero for J not equal to two. So then in that case, then your CI is just H two, right? Of course, this alpha will not be usually zero or one. It will be some value between them because of exactly how it's defined below. But then you can think of this as attention weights and of course, H is a vector. So um, you're assuming that you're multiplying scalar value alpha IJ to the vector HJ. Then how do you obtain alpha IJ? It's very familiar function that we're using here. It's called softmax. So 
you compute the similarity between the current hj and each of the well the the hj being i mean not current hj but hj is the basically encoder side vector right and then you're computing somebody with the previous hidden state of the decoder so this is the previous hidden state of the decoder and then this is the each time steps hidden state on the encoder side then you basically compute some affinity score that's why it's a this is standing for affinity you can think of that as a, a synonym to similarity and this affinity score is go through what's called softmax that's basically just applying the exponentiation on each score and divide that by the summation of the all the affinity scores exponentiation and we know that this will be the good thing about this is that we know the alpha ij of um, well, because we are on the um, j side up to t, this will be always equal to 1.0. And also, really, the, the interesting characteristic of the softmax is because you're exponent, exponent, exponentiating the, the affinity scores. If these affinity scores are different by, like, say, five or six, then their exponentiation will be really big. I mean, really different, right? So it's really important to know that because you know it's it's good to know that when you're especially debugging because you know what to expect suppose if you have a um e of uh if you your um affinity scores are like something like you know zero and ten just like the quiz we had then well what happens we're gonna go back actually get back to that when we are um going over the answers in the quiz but the difference will be really large how do you compute an affinity score between the um, these two vectors? So these two are, by the way, both vectors, right? It, S minus one and H J are both um, vectors of some dimension d. And how you compute that is there are di different ways. And this exact um, paper or this um, the the first model that used the attention used the affinity score, score called um, additive attention. So how they do is that they use these two inputs. So this actually is the same input, right? Um, and then they do some linear transformation on these two vectors and then apply the 10H. And this will be also then um, a vector in the dimension of RD, for instance. And then you basically just dot product with a Another weight. So these are all the weights, trainable weights. These are trainable weights. And this was very effective that uh, machine translation started to get really better with just increasing data size without any. Well, I cannot say any, but very minimal human manual engineering. And that was really fascinating because SMT was extremely complex. I mean, SMT was basically the method that people used before this kind of a neural translation. And it involves lots of feature engineering. But then NMT, neural, trans, neural trans, machine translation is very simple and fully data driven. You can just increase data size to get it better. And it was pretty clear that by 2016-ish, the neural tr machine translation was better than the SMT. And now it says these you know, lines are dotted because this diagram was drawn in 2016. And people are thinking that, OK, we can improve this further and further. We already actually outperformed the SMT. This is exactly the gap, right? And we can use the LSTM maybe with a more um, engineered networks to make it better and better as we go forward. And well, 
that really didn't happen actually because um, not because the, our machine translation didn't improve since then, but then as we will cover today, well, we no longer use LSTM. We only use attention these days. And this will be basically covered this lecture. And also another thing is that decoding is not super trivial. I was thinking about covering this, this lecture, but then I think I think it's better to actually cover this after we, we go over transformer. So we'll actually cover this in the uh, lecture. Today's lecture is 11, next lecture is 12, so lecture 13, next Monday. But anyway, so, the, so then what happened? Well, transformer is what we're gonna talk about today that basically replaced all the LSTMs. And, what was the behind the transformer? Well, we used the attention from the decoder to encoder. We're assuming that the encoder side, the LSTMs, they, they are enough to understand the input and also contextualize the input. But then that assumption is usually wrong when the input gets really long, or even if the input is not too long, LSTM is very limited in the um, contextualization capability. So, can we actually apply attention on the encoder side? And also, can we do attention better than the, the what we talked about today, which is better now at all? And that actually leads to, and also can we actually just use attention instead of LSTM? Because LSTM is not paralyzable, but the attention is clearly paralyzable. So this basically could lead to the motivation of transformer. Anyway, so the, so I went over the last lecture for a long time because a lot of uh, things we discussed in the last lecture will be relevant today. So hopefully that was helpful. And let's go now, stop the quiz. And I'm gonna save it first so that I don't actually lose it. Okay, so here, are, here they are. So I was actually very happy that um, at least the, all the majority votes are correct. So number one, the answer is false. Why? Attention mechanism with softmax is not differentiable and hence requires reinforcement learning techniques such as policy gradients to train. Well, if I didn't say this, then maybe this is correct because well, I mean, it depends on how you define attention mechanism, but uh, technically maybe attention is, you can think of it as hard attention that you only look at one or two, whereas soft attention is not hard, right? But then softmax actually is used to make it soft. So this is exactly the purpose of making it differentiable. So you cannot say this is not differentiable. Number two, given attention weights of 0 0.2, 0 0.8 and value vectors of one, zero and zero, one on two input tokens, what is the resulting vector after performing attention? Well, we know that attention vector is just summation of alpha ij in hj over j, which means um, you, you multiply 0 0.2 to um, 1 comma 0 and plus 0 comma 8 to 0 comma 1, which is just 0 0.2 and 0 0.8. So the answer is 0 0.2 and 0 0.8. And number three, attention performs softmax on the affinity scores. If the affinity scores are 0 comma 10, then which of the following values is closest to its softmax attention. And I think we had this quiz like in lecture three or something like that to give you the idea or give you the sense of how large the exponentiation can be. So if you actually try to compute this, well, basically you're basically computing what? Um, e to the power of zero over e to the power of zero plus e to the power of 10 
exponentiation, right? And you're computing e to the power of 10, e to the power of zero times e to the power of 10. And e is bigger than two. So you can just actually try to, um, well, let's just focus on this value. Then we know that, well, actually, which would be which way would be better? Let's see. Okay, so let's focus on this value, and we know that. Um, e to the power of zero plus e to the power of 10, this is bigger than two to the power of 10. And this is all, of course, bigger than 1,000, right? Then, well, we can say that this value, the, this going into denominator, is what smaller than hence um, this means this is smaller than one over 1000 do you agree because e to the power of zero is just one so i'll just make this one then this is what 0 0.001 and well 0 0.001, it, well, I mean, it's smaller than 0 0.001, so which means it cannot be closer to 0 0.01. It's probably closer to 0, 0, right? Because the difference between 0 0.01 and 0 0.001 is 0 0.009, whereas the difference between 0 0.001 and 0, 0 is 0 0.001. So it's clearly um, the answer should be 0 0.1. Well, this is one way to approximate it with, um, well, without using any calculator. Although maybe you, you could have used the Google to compute this. Okay. So hopefully they were clear. I'll close the quiz. Okay, so let's go into transformer. So what is transformer? So transformer is a model that was proposed in 2017. So if you look at the timeline, well, the end-to-end -end machine translation with just encoder decoder was proposed in 2014. And then so this is the birth of encoder decoder. And then 2015, you have this now attention. And basically the, the introduction of the attention enables a lot of um, advancement in language understanding. And then it took two more years to actually now um, allowed us to entirely just use the attention only and get rid of the LSTMs or anything. And you might wonder, what does that mean? Attention without that, it's just basically just performing um, which vector to bring from the encoder to decoder. Well, we'll get back, to, we'll get to that. But then for now, you can think of it as, well, can we get rid of the RNNs? And you might ask why? And the reason is that the RNNs actually cannot be parallelized. You have to actually compute the previous time step first to compute the next time step. So that was the main motivation. And it only uses the attention on itself. So we're going to see what that means. It's called um, self-attention. Well, actually, this is not really true. Um, it uses the attention on itself on the encoder side. But actually, it uses attention from the decoder to encoder. So actually, this is not a. Uh, Correct statement. So yeah, uh, forget about this. And actually, also proposes a multi-head attention. So it actually performs attention multiple times, not just once. So we're gonna see what that means. And also, it uses a unidirectional attention for decoding. 
And then all these characteristics enable the model to be scaled up and simplified. And this is very important. This is actually very important, um, I would say, a milestone in machine learning in that, well, before transformer, people were all focusing on how you can create the model and creating good model that actually, of course, um, comes from a good human's inductive bias was very critical in making a good model. I mean, good system. I mean, system is basically model trained on data, right? Then um, creating a good system was very dependent on the model and um, data was the second thing. That, that's why people were really interested in how you can be a good model uh, modeler, people called, or uh, how can, you can be good at modeling. But then transformer is, is very simple in terms of, um, well, the, its architecture, although it's very big, it's very repetitive. And then it basically proved us that when we just scale this up, it works so well that you don't have to use anything else than transformer. So basically after this, when we see the papers coming after or like since 2018, you're gonna see that everyone just use transformer and not just NLP. Everyone in division now uses transformer. So transform proof that now we can be more freed from the model centric paradigm and we can move towards data centric paradigm, which means it's more important to design the data or design what we feed into the model or how we feed that instead of how, what the model looks like inside. And so, and if you actually remember what we talked about in lecture one and two, do you remember that we were talking about the, how we can view um, you know, machine learning as a learning of function between input and output? It exactly comes back to that because, well, back then we were saying that machine learning or the, um, really the AI is about learning the relationship between input and output in a generalizable way, then you have to actually somehow define your uh, function space and then try to find a good function within the function space that satisfies the, um, your training data's input output relationship. And basically what we call the model was just trying to really restrict the function space as much as possible so that it's easier to find a good function. But then as we try to restrict the function space with the human's knowledge or human's inductive bias, it is very easy to actually localize or basically just, um, we basically maybe restrict this search space too much that the, what do you call, um, the really the good function no more exists in that function space, which is a really bad thing. And what transformer does is that basically the, what it's telling us is that we don't really have to worry about reducing the function space further than transformer because transformer is already, um, first of all, generic enough to cover different kinds of uh, functions, but also its space is small enough so that you don't have to worry too much about overfitting, which means finding a bad function that just fits the input. So it's a, that's, I think, a better way to think of what Transformer does. Okay, so um, we're gonna have a short break, five minute break until 4.45, and then we're gonna come back and then dissect Transformer into different parts. And then after that, we're gonna go over each part of Transformer. Let's tr I'll try to finish the, um, the basic explanation of Transformer today, and hopefully we can go into more details with the code next lecture. So see you in five minutes.
All right, welcome back. Now let's try to look into how the transformer looks like. So it might look very complicated, but actually it's not too different from what we just saw in the encoder decoder network. So this part corresponds to encoder. Well, you don't see any LSTMs, but still the input of this encoder and the output of the encoder has very similar functionality as the, the encoder that decoder models that we saw today, such as the ones that use attention mechanism. But then there's one um, important difference, which is called positional encoding. So basically, we'll get back to this soon, but on the input embeddings, you give some sinusoidal, I would say something like a noise that disturbs the input embeddings depending on the different positions so that the input, even if, this, if it's the same word, it will have a, a bit different embedding on the, um, when, the, when it goes into encoder. So why do we need that? Because apparently if we just use attention, you cannot differentiate between the words in different positions. So you want to give different noises to words in different positions so that we could, the model can differentiate, differentiate between, the, between them. But then how do you inject noise? It's just, just addition, right, addition. But then other than that, you can think of this black box encoder is exactly same as what we saw in the, um, the previous encoder decoder and the encoder decoder with attention. And if you look at the, uh, the second box, this is decoder. And it's actually, representing the one time step, you can think of it as one time step of decoding. And basically it's um, in the, if it, this was in the LSTM based encoder decoder, this was just single LSTM time step, right? Of course it's more complicated than that, but then still this is also equivalent to, um, very similar to in terms of input and output, the LSTM uh, single time step of a LSTM or GRU in the um, previous encoder decoder. And then you see that there's a linear function. Why do we need that? Because we just need to map this into vocab space. And then we uh, compute softmax. Why? Because we want to make this into uh, probability on the vocab space. And they basically that's the output probability of the, the first um, output in the decoder token level, right? And if that basically that output will go into the next time step, and then we perform the same decoding, but we have um, we use the attention on the from the uh, encoder side again in the same way, and then we perform the next time steps output again, and then we do that iteratively. Of course, the diagram here intends to actually. Um, also show that this such recurrent decoding is happening, but then um, I'm just, I'm, I'm putting it this here so that it's easier to, for you to see how this unwraps. Then, <clears throat> well, then what we have to just do, of course, and we also have this positional encoding to see, to know which, um, well, to, uh, what do you say? Um, to know that, because in the in the one one difference in this transformers decoder from the um, um, the previous the previous decoder is that you actually use the entire um, output that you produced in the decoder stage as the um, input to this decoder. So then you still need the position encoding to differentiate between different words in different positions. Same thing, but other than that, it's exactly same. And this will be more clear when we go into the um, code next week. And basically your assignment three main purpose is for you to fully understand how transformer works. That's it. There isn't much coding. 
Okay, so first of all, let's first talk about how we, we can then perform attention. And we're gonna see how we can perform attention on the encoder side. And what, what do we mean by the performing attention on the encoder side? That means that we're performing self-attention self because we, in the previous encoder decoder, we're performing attention from the decoder to encoder. But then now we want to perform attention on itself. So do you remember the attention mechanism from the Baranao et al. 2015? So we have uh, this formulation, we just covered this today. And this formulation is very GPU memory inefficient. Why? Because, let's see why this is inefficient. Suppose that, well, we let's say that we want to perform this um, at once, which means that we basically compute the alpha of SI minus one and J, um, but then because we're doing this on the encoder side, what we're actually trying to do is this. Well, no. H I and H J for all IJ. Then we can just define the same way, right? That's okay for I mean, that's that's perfectly fine for the uh, just computing the uh, the affinity between H I and J. But what if you want to compute this for all the combination of I and J? Well, that means then we have this. Um, I being one to up to T and J being one to T. And we basically have this matrix to fill out, right? And computing this IJ is just basically just filling one of this matrix. But then we have to compute all these values in this matrix, which means we have to perform this um, T squared times, which is, you cannot just do that, you know, with your, you will, it will be very inefficient if you just do this with the um, iterative way. So you have to actually try to parallelize this. And how can you parallelize in, the, in GPU? Well, the first thing you can do is, in fact, this is like where the um, beauty of the parallelization comes in. Because what you can do is instead of uh, computing this in a, um, vector form, you can actually try to put the entire matrix H. But there's a problem because if you put entire matrix H, then they have to have one more dimension so that this you can compute the um, outer product of these two. Uh, well, I mean, not these two, but the uh, matrix by itself. So what you can do is then let's say the H is just um, is a matrix, right? So this is basically just a um, T by the matrix. Then in order to parallelize this, the only way to do is by you create H, uh, H of uh, one, well, the superscript one is basically T times T times D, which is obtained by just stacking the same H on the, um, the first dimension of this tensor. Whereas you can also, so what I mean by is that basically uh, in this case, you are uh, um, just having the same age for every t in the first dimension. So um, I think the best way to say is that um, oh, H1 is just the same age, t times. 
this will be t by t by d and then if you actually now do the same thing that to compute the affinity scores then you can basically say a a of h and h is simply Ten H, but then now you have a, a H one map to some vector space with this W A, and then we plus H one of uh, mapping to U of A, and then if you do this, basically you can then basically obtain the entire um, the matrix of these t square values but the problem is now then you have to actually do this stacking of the same h vectors t times and this can be very large this can be very large that's why we say it's not gpu memory efficient because you're gonna use a lot of space by making this uh, super big rep, a very, uh, has a lot of duplicates to do this in a parallel way. Another way to actually compute the attention is was actually proposed in the same year, Luong et al. It's a more GPU efficient method. So if you try to compute the, uh, the, uh, the same score between HT and HS, um, I mean, it's basically the same thing as HI and HA, instead of uh, doing this, doing the uh, the additive attention, you actually use the multiplicative attention. Which is just multiplying HS to WA and then multiplying this to HT uh, transposed. And the good thing about this is then when you try to compute the score between, um, let's say, H and H, then it becomes just very simple, actually, H transpose W, A, and H. And of course, you never create any matrix that's of size T times T times D. Every matrix is, well, here, of course, H is just a, a T by D matrix. And then how about W? W, A is just a D by D matrix. So everyone's happy. So we, don't, we never create a super big matrix of T by T by D. So that's why it's actually better to use this Luong attention or this multi multiplicative attention in terms of GPU memory efficiency when you're performing especially um, self attention or you're trying to attend on yourself. But there's one also caveat, which is, well, do you want to actually, um, compute the, well, uh, not really caveat actually. So you might, you might ask like, why do you, why, then, um, why do you want to compute the attention score uh, itself? And the point is then by performing the attention itself, we're thinking that the attention will, it's kind of a function that's mapping the, this matrix into another vector space in a way that very it's uh, well very um, compatible or very um, pertinent to how the language modeling works but then it's, it's a kind of a hard question to really answer because um... oh yeah that's right yeah yeah that's right you're right sorry so you're actually correct it's very good I mean, yeah, I messed up the uh, dimension, but then you're right that the, it should be um, H times W A times H transpose. Of course, this will be the other way if H was um, D by T, right? The question is, uh, is W A symmetric definite? Well, it, well, I mean, it doesn't have to be. If you're asking about the math mathematical definition, yeah.
Sorry for a question of the elemental topic. Uh, you said the ions are not paralyzable. Would it be possible to paralyze them not across the recombination, but across the spatial layer? Um, okay, so I'm not sure I, I understand this question well, but here, what is spatial layer? I see, but then still, you, you can only compute the second layer OSTM after you compute the first layer OSTM, right? So it's actually bottlenecked by the, um, the previous layer. So you cannot paralyze it across layers. Does it make sense? Okay, so okay, so let's now go back to okay, so now the um so the transformer uses the multi multiplicative attention, but it does it in a, a bit different way. So how they do is instead of actually just having one WA, you actually can, what you can do instead is then um, you can actually try to map um, H into um, two matrices. One is um, H multiplied by W4 key and H multiplied by W4 um, query. And then you basically obtain the A of uh, H comma H by Met, met multiplication of these two matrices, of course, one transposed. So then what that means is then you multiply WK2 WQ transposed. So you might think, why? wait, this is like widely different, but actually it's not too different because if you actually compute this, then this becomes H of WK times WQ times H of transpose. And we're just saying that WK times WQ is just, they're both triangle weights. So you can think of this as just a you know, single weight, it's exactly same as what we saw here, right? But um, we just do that. Well, actually I don't remember whether this has an empirical better um, performance than having just one weight, but then anyways, we, we can just compute these um, HWK and HWQ at the same time parallelizable way. So it doesn't really matter. And it just gives us a parallelizable way of, um, I mean, uh, easier way to uh, compute that. But you can think of this as very similar to how you compute uh, the mul multiplicate attention, but just in a, I would say a more um, consistent way. Why do we call, call this key and query? Because when you're performing attention, you're, you're, when you're attending into something, you call the, uh, the target to be query because you're attending into that query and that you're attending with key. So the source is key and the, the target is query, but then it's because we're doing this yourself. I mean, it doesn't have any difference really. It's symmetric, but then you just call it key and query, okay? So you usually call this Q, this is Q and this is a key. And that's exactly what it means here, K and Q. And that's why we do metmol, right? Metmol, of course, we transpose on the key side. So you understand what this metmol is. Now let's try to understand what scale is actually. So in fact, um, we're gonna cover this in the next slide. 
as we saw, Q is what? H times W over Q and K is uh, H times W over K. And then if you compute Q of T, Q of K, Q K T transpose, then this becomes H W Q W K transpose and H transpose, right? Actually, I think I made a mistake here too. It should be transpose here too, right? Anyways. So then we're saying that, of course, this is kind of just, um, well, theoretically similar to just one matrix, triangle matrix, but um, that's why we're computing. But we see an interesting thing here. Like, what is this? And well, so why, why do we have this? So actually this will be in your assignment the reason why we have this uh, square root DK mathematically, but then here I will just talk about more of a um, intuition why we have this. Well, so DK is actually the dimension of uh, the, the either H or W's um, hidden state. So basically um, H is T times dk and w q is real number of uh, dk times dk and of course same as wk so what does this mean if we divide by square of dk we mean we mean that if the the size the the, the dk becomes large we want to make sure that we want to scale that down so that um, this value will not be too, too, too big. This value will not be too big. And why is that? Well, it's exactly why the softmax, when the values become really large, then th their difference will be really large too, right? And then we know that what happens is that if the value that goes into softmax becomes large, or I mean, the, the scale becomes large, then um, their difference after applying softmax will be much bigger. So I'll give an example. Suppose that you're performing softmax on, um, let's go back to the same example. On zero one. And what is softmax of zero one? Well, that's just um, one over one plus E comma E over one plus E which is about one over 3 point, I think seven was it? And then uh, 2.7 over 3.7. So I'm not sure I'm really exact, but then this will be about what? Something like um, 0 0.3, 0 0.7, which is not too bad. But then what if you actually multiply this by 10? then this will be zero and 10. And we saw that this will be very close to 0 0.01, 0 0.999. And we are basically saturating this attention of weights really a lot by just multiplying by 10. And what's the problem with the saturation? Well, if you saturate, then you will not get gradient for val values that are really small. So you will not get the gradient through this 0 0.001 because it's so small. So your model will not train well. So the point is when we're applying softmax, we don't want this, um, the scale to be large, but then we know that the scale will be large if the DK is big, because when DK is big, then your inner product will be, your matrix multiplication will be big by, um, well, I mean, it's, it's, it has a higher probability to be big statistically. It has a higher variance basically. So um, you will see actually, you will actually, you, that will be your assignment in assignment three, but um, hopefully you will be able to resolve it more mathematically in the assignment, but hopefully you get the intuition why we need this scaling. This scaling allows us to basically um, avoid the saturation. Of softmax. And after we apply the softmax, what is this multiplication of V? Well, that's exactly the same thing as um, when we're doing the attention, we always, after we obtain the attention weights, we do the, um, 
we actually use the attention weights to uh, proportionally extract the vectors from the um, source, right? Remember this, this equation, C is equal to J of alpha ij and hj. So exactly the same thing here. But then why do we have this matrix multiplication? Well, because the resulting value of the softmax, let's say that is A. Then um, A is, so let's say that A is softmax or whatever goes in. Then what is this um, dimension? This, the dimension will be just T by T. Right? Because it's basically just telling you what your attention weights is from the source index to target index. Yeah, so the, the um, so there's a question that why is not DK but square root DK? So here's a short answer. So this is actually something you want to prove in your assignment. So I'm not going to actually really uh, give you the full answer, but then um, you can think of it like this. The fact, the basically, the, when you're multiplying, when you're doing the inner matrix multiplication or the, doing the inner product, the the value, well, I mean the 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 likelihood that the value will be large actually is proportional to square root, not the um, dk. So that's why it's mathematically it's more correct to actually scale down to square root dk. So if dk is 100, then basically you're saying that you're dividing it by 10 and it mathematically it makes more sense. And um, hopefully you will be, uh, it'll be pretty clear in your assignment as you actually walk through that. But then suppose A equals softmax, then you, this is just a um, matrix of T by T, right? Then what happens if you multiply AV is just um, basically you're resulting in T by D, DK matrix. But of course, this is a, the, the matrix size equal, equal to the matrix size of V, but then, um, wait, I'm sorry. This is not a good way to say. AV will be a member of, I mean, will be um, size of AV will be T by DK. But then of course it's not equivalent to V. V is also T by DK. But what happened is then because the attention matrix now has all these weights by applying A to V, you have basically processed this um, summation thing inside. So it's actually good to actually prove yourself by doing the math or trying to make um, it, um, I would say, trying to understand thoroughly why multiplying the attention matrix to V actually is performing this, um, the weighted vector summation I can at least tell you that it's actually equivalent. It's not too hard to prove it, but um, hopefully it's, but still notation wise, very, it could be very confusing if you, uh, if I try to do it uh, and then show it to you, it's probably, um, try to actually see, try to, try to see if it makes sense to you. And then we can come back to that um, in the next lecture if it's still not super clear why this AB results in the same thing as C. But anyways, the, Attention QKV basically results in a matrix that has the same size as the input. Well, the, what was the input? Because input was H, right? So H basically mapped to this Q, K, and V. And then by performing attention, you have a new, new matrix. And that matrix, we can maybe call it, if the, this was H1, then we can call this H2. And what we can say is that H2 and H1 have same size. So H1, H2 are both T by DK matrix. So we now see that this attention is basically performing some sort of a um, um, transformation. That's why it's called extra transformer. It's some 
performing some transformation on this matrix H i, H1, H2, without changing its dimension or size, but making some doing something different. So if this attention function is very powerful, we can just stack that several times so that we can model really complex relationship without, well, of course, um, changing, we're worrying about whether we can stack it or without worrying about making the model more complicated because in this case, we're just using the same architecture over these um, several layers. Okay, so I think we're a bit behind today, but um, we're now out of time. So I'm going to end the, the um, today's class here. We're gonna come back to that on Wednesday and then carry on. And hopefully we can go up to um, language model, but then if we do not, I'm thinking that probably I will not, I will um, reduce the, um, the amount of time I talk about the decoding strategy because it's, I think it's relatively unimportant compared to transformer and language model. Okay, so that's it for today. I'll see you on Wednesday. See you.